going to start off with this morning. Should we turn down the lights? Yeah. Okay. Can somebody, can somebody get the lights right over there? <coughs> Thank you. <laughs> Maybe we'll do the video later. It's got time. Yeah. Yeah. I had that a minute ago and then it turned off, so I'm going to redo it. I'll get it going in a minute. Okay, turn the light back on. It'll work later, too. So, you know, it's not like uh, we, get, we had to do it at the beginning, but. In fact, I was wondering, would it be better to do it? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. You know? Uh, all right. So, I don't know for sure if we're going to use all of these or not, but if somebody would grab that, and if I call for it, be ready to read it. There's two on that one. Um, no? <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> So, this morning, uh, we're going to be talking about uh, Psalm 78. So, if you will, turn there. And we're going to be covering the first uh, eight verses in Psalm 78. So, before we get started, let me pray. God, I want to thank you for your word. Thank you for the, the way it is instructed, the way it teaches us, the way it uh, guides our paths. And I pray this morning, Father, as we look to your word, that it would do its work in our lives, that it would be uh, transforming to our thinking and help us to uh, renew our minds in what, uh, the way we act and think and, and uh, live our lives. We just commit that to you in Christ's name. Amen. Mm -hmm. So, quick question. Uh, how many parents in the room? Uh, a number of you. Okay. How many grandparents in the room? Okay. So, almost as many hands on grandparents as parents. <laughs> so, uh, I don't know that there were that many that, uh, there were a few that didn't raise their hand. So, but let, this uh, lesson this morning, speaks to, to grandparents, but don't feel excluded if you're not a grandparent, okay? Don't feel excluded if you're not a parent, okay? Because it has application uh, to us even in other arenas, whether it be with our uh, brothers and sisters, nieces and nephews, our neighbors, uh, so, don't get lost in all that, okay? All right, so Psalm 78 says, O my people, 
Hear my teaching. Listen to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter hidden things, things from old, which we have heard and known, what our fathers have told us. We will not hide them from our, their children. We will tell the next generation the praiseworthy deeds. We will tell the next generation the praiseworthy deeds of the Lord, His power, and the wonder He has done. He decreed statutes for Jacob and established the law in Israel, which He commanded our forefathers to teach their children, so that <clears throat> so the next generation would know them, even the children yet to be born, and they in turn would tell their children. Then they would put their trust in God and would not forget his deeds, but would keep his commands. They would not be like their forefathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation who, whose hearts were not loyal to God, whose spirits were not faithful to him. Okay, so one of the, to me the, the key, key verse or key phrase in that section right there, uh, I wanted to write down comes in uh, what verse is it? Six. That the next generation might, NASB says that the ge next generation might come to know. Okay, all right, so, so what is one application, we'll, we'll leave that, okay, what is, what is one application from um, this section? Can somebody give me any application from what we just read? Even one little nugget. Teach your children. Teach your children, that's right. So teach your children, Mike. Learn it yourself first. Learn it yourself first. Yeah, you're not going to be able to teach it if you don't know it. That's exactly right. Um, you know, some parents think they can, they can let their kids make their own decisions. You know, about what they want to do, about what religion, what uh, church, uh, Bible study, uh, devotions. But, you know, the psalmist here uh, makes it pretty clear that we're to teach our children and that, we, that they might have hope in God rather than beat down, down by the storms of society, the chaos, the culture. Uh, we need to constantly tell our kids about the blessings that will come their way if they walk according to God's word and the heartbreak that they'll experience if they choose a different direction. Our, uh, we have a privileged responsibility. So how did your parents teach you the Bible? A little feedback here from your personal experience. How did your parents teach you the Bible? They didn't. Who, who said that? Here. Yours didn't. No. Okay. Okay. <coughs> so my, there are things. My, my, I would say my parents didn't either. But we were raised in the Catholic Church. Right. So the, the, really it's not connected to the Bible. Right. Kind know. of a religious setting. Yeah. But not. Not biblical. Not biblical. Yeah. yeah. I, I share your. I didn't own a Bible. I share your past. In college, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe out of high school. Yeah. So, somebody else. My my mom did. She got saved um, when I was like ten, and it was out of a crisis, and she lived it out. Whatever she read, she lived it out, and she made it verbal to us. We prayed every night. We and she didn't know what she was doing, and she said, "I don't know what I'm doing, but we're going to do it together." So. <laughs> 
learn together, yeah. I think as children in some ways, you may not always realize that what your parents are teaching you is from the Bible. Yes, you may say prayers when you go to bed, but they had all those little parent little things that they say, like, you know, do unto others the way they do it, be good, you know, be faithful. You know, they would say little things. Prin which biblical principles, maybe? Principles, yeah. Yeah. but yeah. maybe, yeah. but you didn't maybe know it was from yeah. the Bible then. Okay, yeah, yeah. So was there somebody else over here? I see a hand. Hey. Uh, uh, my parents lived there in front of me, too. And also, um, they would read the Bible before we went to school every day. Mm. And of course, wow. we were champion at the bit, afraid we're going to be late and all that. <laughs> <laughs> it gave us a trust in the Lord yeah. because we knew Daddy would pray for tests that were coming up. Or, yeah. You know, just build a foundation there. Yeah. Right. yeah. Yes, yeah, I, Carolyn. My parents didn't go to church, but. At, in that time, years ago, we had the buses that come down the street from different churches. So they sent me to a Baptist church <laughs> every Sunday so, because that was where um, I can look back now and see how God was in part of all of it. Yeah, yeah. The, despite their, I mean, they had good intentions maybe, but they didn't really know yeah, exactly. uh, how to do it themselves. So, yeah. Well, kind of a cool story. Uh, who in here has heard of Jonathan Edwards, a uh, famous, strong pastor, teacher? Uh, one of his most famous uh, sermons was titled uh, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. Uh, you might remember uh, that title. He was a giant of faith. Uh, the Lord used mightily uh, to take time one of the few genuine revivals in our country. Uh, he not only preached to his congregation, but he preached to his family as well. A study was done that revealed that of his direct descendants, 14 became college presidents, 100 became college professors, 106 became ministers and missionaries, 108 became lawyers and doctors. On the other hand, a man named Jacob Jukes mocked Jonathan Edwards and his revival. Here's what happened to his family. 400 were physically self-incapacitated. That is, they lost limbs or otherwise were unable to function due to inflictions from fights, brawls, and etc. 310 became professional paupers. 60 became thieves. Seven were convicted of murder. Only 20 became tradesmen, and 10 of those 20 learned their trade while serving in the penitentiary. In the penitentiary. Jonathan Edwards embraced the things of God and taught them to his children. Jacob Jukes mocked the things of God, and the fruit of both of the men was apparent. What a powerful story. You know, um, you know I mean, I, I kind of <clears throat> cringed a little bit at, at the end of that because I have a son that served eight years <coughs> in the penitentiary. You know, and, and we did work toward teaching and training them. So it's not a guaranteed thing. I mean, you know, I don't want to sit up here and say that there's an equation that if you do this and this and this, that your kids are going to turn out uh, wonderful and well and happy and whole and strong believers. But uh, if you're not, <laughs> if you're the Jacob Jukes and you're mocking God, then it's very unlikely that uh, they will have that chance. So... Okay, so next question is, uh, how many of you raised your hands in here as parents, uh, grandparents, how are you or did you seek to teach your kids about the Bible? So what are the things that you had in place as parents uh, teaching your children uh, about the Bible? No volunteers? Come on, come on, come on. Peter? Uh, we once we got saved, okay, but it was you know I was twenty something when it happened. Uh, once the kids were old enough to join Awanas, we went to the Awanas, and 
we got involved and uh, were uh, people at the Awana, Awana uh, Wednesday evening mm -hmm. class and, and uh, you can't teach something that you don't know so you had to take some time to figure out what you were going <laughs> to say. Right. Yeah. So, so uh, who has Deuteronomy 1 6? Brad, you didn't put any scriptures on here, so I'm not sure. <laughs> it might be. <laughs> Did I have to cut yours off? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. All right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I got the wagon. You're supposed to have it memorized. Yeah. <laughs> I should, this is a good one. Yes, the one So Deuteronomy what? One six. Six. one six. Six through eight, okay. Nine through nine. These words which I am commanding you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your sons and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets on your forehead. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. So the testimony uh, that God wanted transmitted from generation to generation by the careful instruction of succeeding families was his, his words. I mean, he wanted that to be the mode of communication from generation to generation. And we have the command for the oral transmission uh, very clearly from the Bible. So uh, verse 7 says, Then they would put their trust in God and would not forget his deeds, but would keep his command. So what was the, what was the goal? What was the point of transmitting that? I mean, it's pretty clear. I mean, I just answered it by the... Right. So what, somebody say it. Somebody say the words. What was the goal? Obedience. Obedience. Okay. Yes. Yes. So that they would know them. I mean, tell them so that they would know. Somebody said earlier, I forgot who said that, that was so accurate that if you don't tell, if you don't communicate it, then they don't know. I think Mike is the point you made earlier. So... Uh, so that they would know them. The design of teaching is practical. Holiness toward God is the aim that is what we aim at. That they might develop healthy habits and spiritual discipline. So, here's a huge big question. How important is this? What happens if a generation does not do this? What is the one of what is one of the costs of not being diligent? You lose that generation. They don't, they won't, they'll turn their backs on God. They'll forget the works of God. They won't know it. They won't know it. Yeah. Aren't we seeing results right now? I think you're right. Yes. I think you're right. I mean, there's, what yeah. is, what does our culture reflect right now? Right. Uh, it's a godless, self-centered, um, me society that uh, doesn't, adhere to godly principles, does it care about that, it's not important to them, and so what happens? Yeah. So. Well, that, and you were talking about how this doesn't only apply to um, parents. We took God out of every circle. We took God, you can't speak about God as a football coach, and you can't speak about God in this situation. We, we lost that generation because we didn't speak up into the next generation whether they're our blood or not. Okay, so the, this next concept I would like to uh, share with you or talk to you about. Do we have a long view of spiritual growth or a short view just like the other things in our lives? So what are some things that we have a short view of? Give me some examples. Uh, when you go to get something to eat and you're driving down the road, what do you want? 
That's for your chicken. Yes. yes. What? Fast food. You want something quick? Yeah. You want it now? Yeah. Yeah. So you have a short view of that. I mean, it's, I'm hungry and I want it now. And I can stop over there at that place and they can get it to me. Mm -hmm. um, what about um, even shopping online? I mean, how quick can you get that? Right. I mean, I want it, and I want it tomorrow, and they can do it. And so, you know, there's, there's no, you don't even have to plan that much. I mean, you can just press the button, and it's there. So, uh, you can uh, banking. You can get your check from your employer if they don't put it in the bank for you, and you can send it to the bank, and you don't even have to go down and see those people at the bank, those tellers. So. You know, so I guess it, the, the point I'm trying to make is, is that so much of our lives has a short window, short view of, of short-sighted view of things. And that's not God's intent and purpose for our spiritual growth. He want, his design is looking into the future. He wants us to think not only of our children, but our grandchildren and their children and their children. Um, Larry, I think probably your family history uh, speaks volumes to me in that regard because you've shared before how important your family desire was to develop children and grandchildren and future generations. Uh, in my, Correct. Yeah. Um, I'm just thinking about that as you're talking about generation to generation. I have, a, I've been very fortunate in that uh, I can tell you about my great great grandparents and the generations that followed, um, and that's why I'm so. That's why I like to pray for my children's children's because that's what they did for me. I know that. My, my grandparents were praying for me before I was born. You know, my, my uh, great, great granddad was the, uh, the first Lutheran minister to come to Texas in 1854 and brought his congregation from Prussia because they were okay. oppressed over there. And uh, every generation after that, many of them were pastors and were teachers and the Christian schools and so forth. And my dad's, my, that was on my mom's side, my dad's parents go back years and years, generation after generation. And we, we learned the, the, the history of our ancestors and how faithful they were to the Lord and to their children in sharing that down to the generations today. Who has the Psalm 103, 17? And Psalm 145, 1 through 4. Uh, uh, 17. Okay, can you read, read those? Oh, are those on separate sheets? Yes. Okay, which one do you have? Uh, 103, 17. Okay, read 103, 17. But the loving kindness of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him, and his righteousness to children's children. And then Psalm 145, 1 through 4. I will exalt you, my God. O King, and I will bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you, and I will praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord, and highly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. One generation shall praise your works to another, and shall declare your mighty acts. So how, how and we, Larry, you shared a little bit about yours, but how were you uh, impacted or influenced by your grandparents? Uh, did your grandparents play a role in your life, Martha? Yeah. My grandmother, uh, about our only vacations, because we lived so far from both sets of grandparents, uh, we would go in the summer and at Christmas time. So we saw them twice a year, pretty much. And every summer, we, the kids, we kids would stay, um, you know, for a couple of weeks with grandparents. My grandparents lived in a, my mother's, Parents lived in a small town in Louisiana, and my grandmother always had her Bible open in the evenings, and she always had, uh, well, she taught the Sunday school class, and so when we were visiting, 
if we were old enough, because it was small, small Methodist church. And uh, we didn't always have a, even a kids class to go to. So we go to the adult class too. And uh, she would teach our Sunday school lessons. So, Great impact there. Yes. Who has Second Timothy one for a, one five? I do. For I am mindful of the sincere faith within you, which first dwelt in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and I am sure that it is in you as well. So Timothy was impacted greatly by his grandmother. Um, the Bible says we're to create such an atmosphere in our homes that at an early age our children will be grown, drawn to embrace. Jesus, and then as grandparents, that's our role as well. Uh, my grandparents were not influential. Yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. I was just going to comment on, I think a lot of times that um, parents will start out well, mm -hmm. you know, they might get like a kid's Bible and read the stories and whatever, but they're children's stories. And they never really make the jump from the children's story to the adult version mm -hmm. and what that means in your life. And yeah. so sometimes I think kids grow up with that children's story, mm -hmm. and then like everything else in childhood, you kind of put it away. Mm -hmm. I know that was for when I was a child, but it doesn't really apply to my life now. And I, I think that's a mistake that we can make as parents and grandparents. Mm -hmm. I think you're right. I think you're right. <clears throat> well, my grandparents were not influential in my life spiritually. Uh, you know, they did, they weren't brawlers and cussers and, you know, I mean, they weren't bad people, but I didn't have any uh, spiritual impact from them at all. Uh, I came to faith as, as an adult after living in a moderately religious home, um, Daryl, like you, um, but I didn't have a godly heritage growing up, but I definitely want to pass that godly heritage on to my grandchildren. I mean, that's something that is very, very important uh, to me. So, uh, so what are some practical ways as grandparents um, that we can pass uh, faith and that godly heritage on to our grandchildren? Prayer. Daily devotion. All right, so if you have daily contact. Right. And when you do have contact, make sure that. Yeah, yeah, devotions. yeah. So devotions, when, we're, when we have opportunity. Okay, that's good. I, I think, too, the power of prayer is the biggest relief for me because I, you know, sometimes we can't impact them. Yeah. And I think that's where we get the ability to lay our our trust in God's timing and he's going to work in their lives in spite of everything I did wrong and in spite of everything I did right. Mm -hmm. He's going to work in his time and in his way because he loves them even more than I do. And I, that's that to me is the biggest yeah. blessing we can be right. there. I think it's, it's your grandparents' role, I think sometimes it's difficult to have a direct influence on them. I think it's important to maintain uh, conversation with dialogue. I think it's important to try to provide a good example. Because kids, as they go from young kids to growing up, at some point they've got to make that religion their own. There's almost everybody goes through this phase where it's like, well, this would have been taught, you know, how does it really relate to me? Some just stayed away. Because they don't talk, I think as a, as a grandparent, you have an opportunity to still capture them when they're in that phase where they may be lost and they may go the direction they're going to take. And you maintain a good example in conversation and a dialogue with them. They'll, they're more, uh, they can more easily communicate with the grandparent than they can with their parents most times. And don't miss that opportunity. Right. Because we have an incredible opportunity when we have it uh, to invest in them. And if we waste the opportunity, then it's gone. Um, little quick little story. Uh, our 11-year-old grandson, Isaac, uh, asked Jane this week if, you know, we, we've, we've kind of brought them to church. I mean, we've tried to invest in them and tried to bring them uh, 
uh, every opportunity we had to this church and uh, even the older grandson, uh, Ian, when he was younger. Um, so, you know, they, they've been influenced uh, by this body. And so Isaac asked Jane if there were other churches, other places like Tower Bible Church. Mm. And she said, well, yeah. Yeah, there's, there's, she said, that have a wana and things like that. And youth group, yeah, yeah, there's churches like that. And he said, well, do you think that there's going to be a church like Connor Bible Church in Maine? Mm -hmm. And she said, I don't know. Yeah. So, I mean, for us as grandparents, that is a huge prayer request. Right. That, uh, you know, not only would there be a <laughs> that church there, but that Jenny and Abel would see the value of it and step into it. Um, so, um, you know, we've attempted to be diligent uh, in getting them connected. It's, it's uh, it hasn't, hasn't been easy. So, unfortunately, our influence is about to diminish, but we will still uh, work toward that spiritual impact and it's going to be different so uh, who has John 3 John 3 uh, verse, four? verse 4 yeah I have that one too <clears throat> I have no greater joy than this to hear of my children walking in the truth so a little out of context I mean uh, John's talking about a uh, different situation but I think that's the principle of that verse is applicable um, Billy Graham um, wrote How to Leave a Godly Legacy. Uh, Billy Graham said, The greatest legacy one can pass on to one's grandchildren is not money or other material things accumulated in one's life, but rather a legacy of character and faith. No one on earth will pray for you like your grandparents. Even when they are sickly, they can work at being a godly grandparent simply by praying for their grandchildren. Another way grandparents can be a tremendous influence is by telling their testimony to their grandchildren over and over. Tell stories about God's provision, about how he's always kept his promises, about his faithfulness. Grandparents have a long life that they have lived, and now they're at this stage where they're able to sit and tell stories of his goodness. What a remarkable way to leave a legacy. So let me... Um, let me see if I can get this going. Here we are. Okay. you this we know to 
are children's children We've just one wish You'd know Jesus Christ For who He is When all is said and done We pray we've left His mark Through our grandparents On your heart Through our grandparents On your heart And year by year season uh, but Lord we uh, we know that you uh, have been placed in their lives and they know you and uh, desire to continue to uh, follow you and walk with you and so I pray for these boys Lord that you would help them to uh, have a, a longing and a desire to uh, know you more and that you would fill them with your Holy Spirit Lord to overflowing, that they would be a testimony, not only to the kids at, at their school that they're going to be going to their new school, but to even their parents, Lord, uh, that you would just uh, magnify and glorify your name through these boys, Lord. And we just praise you and thank you in Jesus' name. And Lord, we pray that you would find a 
church, just like mm -hmm. Conroe Bible Church for these children. One that has a wellness or a program like that. We pray for their new friends that you're already arranging. We pray that there would be a smooth transition into their new community and that you have friends waiting for them to receive them, to connect them, and to teach them about their new home. Lord, we um, pray that there will be teachers there that will be um, special teachers for these guys and um, make good relationships with their parents. And um, we pray for you to be conducting the path of their education, but we pray for the people that will be doing it. And um, Lord, we pray that um, the connection between Brad and Jane and their grandchildren will become even stronger. Thank you. With the distance between them, Lord, you can do that. Yes. Mm -hmm. Father, we just know that as it's been so beautifully said, you are going with them. Yes. You never forsake us. You never depart from us. Your compassion and love is everlasting and uh, nourishing, Father. I just pray that uh, as they leave, you will give them a safe journey, that your guardian angels will guide and protect them all the way up there, that they'll quickly find their own home, that uh, they will, Abel and Jenny will, will grow closer together and closer to you, Father, during this time, that uh, they'll find a church home that will uh, teach your word and love one another as we do here at Conroe Bible. I just thank you for the guidance and the love that uh, uh, Brad and Jane have shared with these children and, and grandchildren. And I ask that uh, we know that that love will not depart from them as they go to Maine, but it will continue. I just thank you for the teaching that Brad has given us today. Remind, them, remind us of our duty as parents and grandparents, and even those that don't have children, our duty to share the word and nurture the young people in the next generation, Father. I just uh, thank you for his teaching today, Father. But I do want to commit Ian and Isaac and uh, Elliot to you. And I just pray for that they would grow in the admonition of the Lord. That their time uh, in Maine would be valuable. That they would uh, plug in with the local church. And that uh, you would work in their lives in strong ways to mature them as strong believers and as men that serve you well. Sure. Father, we uh, we thank you for the generations that are represented here. For uh, a grandfather and a grandmother and grandboys. And, uh, I thank you for their for how you crafted them. Yes. How you've given them a house and a, and a place and, a, and an adventure to that they get to be a part of. And I also thank you for the history they've been able to be a part of. Yes. That they have folks in Texas that love them. And folks in this church that love them. And uh, parents in, that are going to be transported to Portland that to love them. And I pray that you grow them in their love for each other and for this place and the adventure. And for uh, Mimi and Papa. Pray these things in the strong name of Jesus. Amen.